Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the um, webinar, uh, Status of Emerald Ash Borer in Maryland for Woodland Owners, Urban and Suburban Areas. Um, I would uh, hope you can hear me. If somebody could just respond in the chat box that you uh, can indeed, indeed hear me, that would be helpful. And we're going to get going here in just uh, one or two minutes. It seems like everybody can hear well. I hope you're inspired by the music. We're going to get going here in just a minute. Um, if anybody is having a problem with um, the sound and stuff, uh, usually the best thing to do is just to uh, get out and get back into the Connect session. Again, I'll just uh, wait here a minute. We have three speakers today. I hope you will uh, enjoy the presentations, which will be recorded and posted on our website. All right, we're going to get going here. Um, my name is Jonathan Kays. I'm an Extension Specialist with the University of Maryland, uh, Crawford Extension. Uh, University of Maryland Extension, and uh, this is part of our webinar series for the Woodland Stewardship uh, Program. And I have some information up there if you want to subscribe to our uh, webinar webinar list. Uh, the information is provided there as well as on our website on the various events calendars and things like that. Um, or you can contact us through uh, my assistant Andrew Kling, whose address is there. Uh, this session can handle 100 people. I don't know if we'll have that many, but uh, all the webinars will be recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube channel, which if you just do a Google search on the University of Maryland FSE, which is Far Storage of Education, um, you'll be able to see it. It should be posted by the end of next week. Uh, this is our what our website is, and you'll uh, you'll see up on the upper right uh, on the, under resources. There's a uh, thing for our connection to our YouTube channel. I encourage you to go there for other information that might be available, might be helpful to you. Um, during this session, um, we have three speakers. Um, um, Kim Rice uh, with Maryland Department of Agriculture, uh, Mike Raup with the University of Maryland Extension, and myself, Jonathan Kays, covering the three different topic areas we're going to discuss here today. If you have a question, uh, the way we communicate is through the chat box there. And I'd encourage you to type your questions in. Uh, many times the speakers can see those questions and can many times address them as they go along. Uh, if not, you know, we can um, address them at the end and make sure they're covered. Uh, we'll go at least an hour, about an hour here and we'll stay as long as people would like to, uh, to answer questions. So uh, with that, um, I have just a few polling questions just to ask you to find out who is here. and. Um, if you would just answer these questions, you can see, uh, trying to find out what state you live in. And this will help us identify our audience. Uh, also, just curious, you know, who you are in terms of your occupation as a forester, arborist, so on and so forth. And uh, also asking the question that in your area, have you seen uh, EAB mortality in your area, whether it's in woodlands or on urban suburban trees, either one, that, that, that's fine. And uh, uh, also, just trying to find out a little bit about you in terms of how much land that you may actually have under your control that you manage or you, you oversee in one way or another. And uh, the final question we have is just a question uh, trying to determine, you know, if you had to drive to a county extension office in your county uh, to view this presentation rather than seeing it over the computer, probably in your home or at your office, you know, how long, approximately how far would you have to travel? And that just gives an idea of... Um, proximity of, of where you are to various locations. So those are the uh, those are the things I see that most of our folks are from Maryland, uh, but we have some from Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Um, we have a number of woodland owners and homeowners and state and county employees. Um, and uh, most people, 30% or so, have seen EAB mortality in their area. And uh, in terms of management, most most properties are relatively small, but we have some. Actually, 40% of the people own more than 100 acres, so they have a lot to uh, to consider in terms of addressing ash problems. And in terms of mileage, uh, most people are um, within 15 miles anyway. So, given that, I am going to uh, go to our first speaker, who is Kim Rice, with the um, Maryland Department of Agriculture, and. Um, I would ask her to unmute her microphone, and her slides are coming up now. And she'll Hi, take about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll oh, go on to Mike and me? so on and so forth. So again, if you have questions, oh, Kim, great. Good. 
I think everybody, I can hear you fine. I think uh, other folks can as well. So I will mute my microphone and uh, you go right ahead. Okay, so um, I was asked to sort of give a history and an update on Emerald Ash Borer in Maryland. Um, I work with the Department of Ag, so I work sort of on the regulatory end of the Emerald Ash Borer and the survey. Um, this is this is the uh, Emerald Ash Borer, just a lovely picture of this beast. It's Agrilus planipennis. And I wanted to start with just to give you an idea of what um, we've seen in Maryland. So this is an ash tree that we saw August 20th, 2009 in Prince George's County. It looks good um, overall. So one year later, um, in September of 2010, this is what that ash tree looked like. So it is infested with emerald ash borer. Um, it didn't take long for the dye back to show up. Um, and so this tree was removed about six months later. So here's a little bit of a brief history lesson on how did emerald ash borer get to Maryland. The, the story starts in Michigan in 2002. Um, a Michigan nursery bought 300 ash trees. It split that shipment between two sites, one in Milford, Michigan, and one in Novi, Michigan. Um, and then in July of that same year, Michigan Department of Ag uh, put a quarantine up. So the quarantine restricted the sale of 150 ash at the Milford site. Um, and the Department of Agriculture in Michigan was not told about the trees at Novi. So those trees were not inspected. Um, so those are the trees that got shipped to Maryland. So we go from Michigan into Prince George's County. And there we are. So there was a nursery in Maryland that had no idea it was getting infested ash trees. And that's how we kind of started our story here in Maryland. Um, this is just a map of the area. Uh, we had a nursery inspector go to that nursery in August of 2003, after the sh trees had arrived uh, in the spring, found um, exit holes, and so the beetle was out. So we started our original eradication in September. Um, we went in. We did about a one-mile buffer. We took out all the ash trees. Um, so we started for the 2004, 2005, and 2006. We did uh, trap surveys in the area. We hadn't found anything in 2004, 2005, but in September of 2006, we found emerald ash borer. So we confirmed that it was outside of the quarantine zone. And that's really when the Department of Ag Maryland Department of Agriculture started its really large sort of emerald ash borer program. We started with an eradication program. And we did a lot of survey area, surveying in this Prince George's County area. But as you can see, we kept finding it. So here, our original uh, nursery is here in the middle. It's in the middle here. And then you can see to the north, we found it outside of that area. So as you can see, our eradication area is growing. Um, And in November of 2007, we find it again outside of where we had been looking. Um, it's down in here. So here we are. This is our original area. And as you can see, it's growing. Uh, we keep finding it um, in other areas. And then this is sort of a eradication zone that we came up with uh, late fall 2007 into the summer of 2008. This is sort of what we called our Mickey Mouse eradication zone. Um, but we keep finding it. So uh, we did a small trapping survey in the summer of 2008. And that's when we found uh, Emerald Ash Borer in Charles County, right on the edge, right here. So again, uh, it's continuing to move. Um, so once that happened and into 2009, we, we started to sort of reevaluate our eradication effort. Uh, was it working? Were we? being successful. Uh, we tried for three years, uh, but we kept finding emerald ash borer and it was moving. So because we weren't able to get all the ash trees and because of the movement of the beetle, um, we decided to sort of halt that eradication zone. And we did. We started to focus more on trapping and survey. We really wanted to keep track of where the beetle was going. So we started in 2008, and we've been tracking trapping every year since. Uh, 2010 and 2011 were really our largest years for trapping. Um, the numbers dwindled just because uh, we get funded by the government. And so they kind of decide how many traps we need to put out. Um, in 2009, that was really one of our first year of 
a large trapping survey. And you can see here, um, this is sort of our positive area here. And we really concentrated most of our traps in that area, but we also put them through most of the state. And here it is the major eradication zone. And as you can see, we keep finding positives out here. So it's moving. Uh, 2010, we added the shore, the eastern shore, um, and a lot more out in the western shore, western Maryland. 2011, again, here we are, more traps um, on the eastern shore, especially down on the lower shore. Um, 2012, we trapped throughout the state as well, um, but we were included in a USDA trap survey. Um, and so they sort of decided where they would like the traps um, along the eastern shore. And we weren't trapping in the areas where we knew uh, EAB to be um, intensive, sort of in the Prince George's County area, Northern Charles, out here in Allegheny. Last year, this was our survey. And again, we pulled some counties out of the survey. We did not survey Montgomery or Howard or Prince George's. And we limited our survey um, in Allegheny and Anne Arundel and Calvert. So throughout the years, um, we've got 11 counties in Maryland that are positive for emerald ash borer. And you can sort of see 2003 was Prince George's. That was that original nursery find. Uh, we didn't get another positive until 2008, and that was in Charles County. And then it just sort of sat in Prince George's and Charles County. And then in 2011, we got four counties, Anne Arundel, Allegheny, Howard, and Washington. 2012, Garrett, Montgomery, and St. Mary's. Last year, we got Calvert and Frederick. Um, so right now, there are only three counties on the western shore that does not have Emerald Ash Borer, Carroll, Baltimore, and Hartford, and then Baltimore City as well, as, as far as we haven't been able to find it. Um, also, the entire eastern shore of Maryland is negative for Emerald Ash Borer. So this is just a quick map of all of our positive sites for trapping. So as you can see, this is our original positive area. Lots of traps positive for Emmett Ash Borer. And then it just sort of moves through to Western Maryland. Um, some of this is natural movement from Emmett Ash Borer, but I also think some of it is human movement, uh, like firewood, things like that. So as more counties become positive, uh, we instituted a state quarantine. And the, art, the regulated articles in that quarantine are the emerald ash borer, ash nursery stock, ash wood, um, including logs, uncom uncomposted ash chips, and all hardwood firewood. And there is also, this is our state quarantine. So it's everything west of the Chesapeake Bay and the Susquehanna River. So if you're on the western shore, you cannot move anything onto the eastern shore of Maryland. And this is the federal quarantine. And this gives you an idea of where emerald ash borer is found. As well, it's as west as Colorado. It's down south into Georgia. Uh, all this yellow area, other than the hashtags here, um, there is free movement of of hardwood. But you must call the states that you want to move it to, because some states have actual state quarantines, and they may be different than that federal quarantine. So I always suggest if you're looking to move firewood from one state to another that's within this yellow area, you need to call that state that you want to move it to. Um, we also do a biocontrol program in Maryland, so we uh, are um, releasing three parasitoids. We started that in 2009, um, and we have seen some associations developing between native parasitoids, woodpeckers, and emerald ash borer. And of the three um, non-native parasitoids that we're releasing, we have recovered all of them. So real quickly, these are the three parasitoids that we release, um, Oobius agrilli, that is an egg parasitoid, Tetrasticus planipennisi is a larvae parasitoid, and Spathius agrilli is another larvae parasitoid. Um, we started in 2008, and again, we have recovered all three of these throughout the state where we've done releases. Um, we also have found some native parasitoids. Uh, which is good news. Um, not in the numbers that we're finding the ones that we're releasing, but they're definitely out there. Um, this is just a picture. We received these parasitoids from a lab in Brighton, Michigan, USDA lab. And so the obvious, which is the egg parasitoid, on these tape here and here are, are emerald ash borer eggs, and they are infested with the obvious. So we go out. It's on an ash log. We nail it to an infested tree, and we let it sit there, and then the obvious will come out. 
And we also release live parasitoids. So we have Spathius and Dratrasticus here. And we just uh, let them go out of the cups, and we put them right onto an infested ash tree. So this is a map of where we've done releases. Uh, we started in that infested area, and we have spread out throughout the state. And then this is a map of where we've recovered. So we have been able to recover them, not in all the sites, but in some. Um, we released 212,373 parasitoids to date at 34 locations. Um, and we've been able to recover them in 17 of those locations. So we think that's pretty good. And we're still going to be releasing uh, as we go along. And every year, we'll go out in the fall, cut some trees down, and see if we can't find those. Um, when to see if we can find this. So Jonathan wants to know what does it mean when they've been recovered. So once we release the parasitoids in a certain location, we'll wait sort of a season. We'll go out the following summer, fall, um, and see if we can find any of those parasitoids, um, either in larval form. Um, and we have rearing barrels as well. So we'll put some of that wood in the rearing barrels. And if the parasitoids are there, they'll come out we'll collect them that way. And that's one of the ways we've been able to find them. So our future plans for biocontrol, generally it takes about five years to see any kind of impact um, for the biocontrol efforts. And we haven't been consistent. Just depends on what we're able to receive. But 2013 yielded the highest number of parasitoids recovered thus far. So that's good news. Um, it does show that Tetrasticus is establishing and dispersing. It's been recovered from four locations where we haven't even done releases. Um, so that's over a mile away from a release is where we would consider not having done a release. Um, and there is also another parasitoid. Spathius galenii, and it's, it's a Russian parasitoid. And we're looking at hopefully uh, getting that released if USDA can get that approved. Um, and lastly, I was given some uh, slides from Tyler Wakefield. He's with uh, Maryland DNR. And he wanted me to give you an update on the emerald ash borer urban inventory. And he is a. Uh, Emerald ash borer forester with the, the DNR. So the urban inventory, he's been using iTree software to inventory street cheese and park trees in selected com communities throughout the state. Um, he does inventory on all tree species to use uh, the data for future pests. So he's look looking at data for emerald ash borer, but he's also taking tree species. So if, for instance, Asian longhorn beetle were to show up, he would know where those host trees were located as well in the different communities. And he helps to uh, develop the response plans in those communities. So last summer, he worked in three communities. He worked in Cumberland, Catonsville, La Plata, and College Park. Um, and it depended on this community on how, what percentage of the street inventory he took. In Cumberland, he took 100%. Catonsville and La Plata, he only did 15%. Um, and then in College Park, he did 100%, assisting the College Park Department of Public Works. So I'm going to go through real quickly two communities that he works in. So this is Cumberland. So Cumberland is positive for emerald ash borer. They have removed some trees, and they're also going to be treating some trees. And this is these pictures here are trees that they're going to treat. Um, they're large trees. Uh, they look healthy, and they're really good shade trees. So these are going to be some trees that they are going to treat. They've also removed trees as well. Um, in La Plata, in Charles County, um, again, another community positive for emerald ash borer. This picture here, this subdevelopment, is completely lined with ash. These are all ash. Every street tree in this community is ash. This community is positive for, for emerald ash borer. Um, so they looked in two neighborhoods. Um, they said they didn't find any ash, no ash found outside of two neighborhoods during that 15% inventory. But both of the neighborhoods they looked at are 100% planted in ash, um, and EABs in both. So. They're probably going to remove most of those trees um, because the trees are so small. Um, they're looking at the next four to five years. And he's working with the town council uh, presently to get approval to remove those trees. 
This is just a map of the two communities. All the points are ash. I think the red points are probably their priority trees. They were able to find EAB in about 5% of the trees. Um, it's most likely in most of those trees. Uh, for this, his future inventory starting in 2014, he's going to look in Hagerstown, Cockeysville, Waldorf, which Waldorf is uh, infested. He's going to look at eight communities in Anne Arundel County, Jug Bay, and the National Guard Training Facility in Allegheny County. And there's his contact information. He really can uh, give you a lot more information on it as well. Um, and just to sort of sum it up, sort of for our perspective at the Department of Agriculture, Maryland, the future of Emerald Ash Borer, EAB is here to stay. Um, MDA will continue with parasitoid releases. That's really where we think we can get them as bang for our buck. Um, we're going to be trapping in counties that are still negative. So for 2014, we're trapping the entire eastern shore. We're trapping uh, Carroll, Harford, Baltimore counties. And we also review the quarantine and make changes as needed. So as if the eastern shore were to become positive, then quarantines would change. So we are constantly doing that. Um, so that's it for me. I'll take any questions. OK. Um, thanks a lot, Kim. I apologize that you, for some reason I, your picture didn't come up on the box there. It's supposed to be in there. <laughs> That's but, right. um, <laughs> no problem. Thanks a lot for that. For those that, that are, um, we'll have time for uh, questions at the end as well. If there's a couple here we can deal with. but. Um, uh, for those that are here for pesticide credits or for Society of American Forester credits, I'm going to give you a secret word after each of the presentations that you can write on your slips when you return them. And for Kim, that word is TRAPS, T-R-A-P-S. So uh, you can make note of that and just please uh, include that. And I'll give you two other words after each of the two other speakers. So um, I want to move on to... Um, well, there's a couple quick questions here. Why don't you just uh, take these? OK. Um, take one or two of them. <clears throat> the first one is, do the parasitoids attack any other insects? So the three that we are releasing have been vetted uh, through um, environmental assessments. And they come from the native range of emerald ash borer, China. And we, they do not. They attack strictly emerald ash borer. OK. All right, thanks a lot, Kim. And if you could hang on, we're going to we'll get some questions later. I want to move on to Mike so that we have our, our time. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mike Raup. And he is an um, extension special entomologist, University of Maryland Extension, College Park. And he will be talking about management and some other considerations. So Mike, can um, we hear you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, you sound great. Well, so why don't you just uh, fantastic. go ahead. Well, welcome, everybody. It's great to be here today to uh, chat a little about EAB. And um, I'll kind of build on some of the things uh, Kim had to say. We'll cover a little bit of the same ground. Um, you know, I'm always surprised. We have an impression that, you know, things are constantly getting worse. Uh, and not only are they getting worse, but you know things are getting worse quicker. Uh, one of the uh, the interesting points, however, I'd like to make with this, uh, as we talk about some of these invasive species, is that really um, this has kind of been going downhill for uh, for a while. Uh, the rate of invasive species introduction, as you can see in this graph. Uh, and this is a non-indigenous forest insect pest, which would include things like gypsy moth and Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer. Actually, the big the big break point in all this came uh, back in the uh, 1860s uh, with the invention of the iron hulled ship and um, steam engine that allowed uh, the rate of uh, inter. Um, intercontinental uh, transport to uh, accelerate very rapidly. It, it issued in uh, a period of time that uh, of vast uh, exploration as we brought in new plants, not only for ornamental purposes, but also for um, uh, crops. And this is uh, this basically is was the onset of this very uh, steep 
climb we see in this graph of um, of non-indigenous forest insect pests and also the high impact pests like the uh, emerald dash borer. Uh, Jonathan, I seem to have lost my pointer on here, uh, that little green pointer. Is there a way you can reestablish that thing? OK, very good. Thank you. And I guess I can drag this around. There we go. All right, so right here in 1860 is, is the period of time I'm talking about. This is when the break really happened. All right. Yeah, they are. Uh, not only are they near Washington, uh, they're in Washington, D.C. They have been for a few years now. Uh, they aren't really quite as big as, uh, as seen on the Washington Monument, but as seen in the palm of my hand. Uh, this is a pretty large insect. It's, it's relatively easy to uh, detect both as the adult and as the larva underneath um, the bark. So. As Kim has already alluded to, uh, this pest first showed up uh, out in um, out in Michigan. Uh, spread pretty quickly over to Maryland with the uh, illegal shipment, uh, but is now found in 21 states and two provinces throughout North America. So this is not a local problem. This is a, a national problem, and we expect this. Uh, primarily to go throughout the range of ash trees in North America, I think would be a fair assessment. This is what it looks like for those of you who hadn't had an opportunity to see what a, a real uh, infestation looks like. This is a shot from the Midwest that Cliff Sadoff sent to me. And you can see in areas that are heavily stocked in Fraxinus, uh, it's going to look like January uh, in June when you have this kind of tree mortality. This is the uh, this is the um, site uh, over in the marshalling yard over in Cheltenham, Maryland. This was part of the EAB eradication project, uh, the attempt to eradicate that thing over in Prince George's County when it was first encountered for the first several years. Um, that project, unfortunately. Uh, like many other of these eradication attempts, uh, simply didn't put the brakes on this thing. And it was a fairly impressive wood pile over there. Uh, you know, on some occasions it was um, uh, the size of the building I work in here. So uh, a lot of ash trees uh, became wood chips as a result of, um, of that particular infestation. In terms of the life cycle of EAB, uh, these guys are just wrapping up their development under the bark of the tree. Uh, the adults are emerging in May through early June, uh, coincident with the blooming of black locust here in College Park. They just started to bloom this week. Uh, these are about two weeks behind where they've been through for the past couple summers uh, due to the cold spring. But uh, a good phenological indicator is uh, when black locust blossoms, this is when adults are going to emerge from the bark of the tree. They're going to feed. There's a period of maturation feeding uh, during which the females uh, have to consume leaves to uh, uh, power up uh, for oviposition. They're going to mate. They're going to fly and lay eggs back on the bark of the tree. The eggs will hatch, the larvae enter the tree and feed on cambium phloem and down into the sapwood a little bit. The reason, of course, um, that these are so lethal, as, as I'm sure you all know, is that woody plants uh, have basically three growing points, the tips of uh, shoots, the tips of roots, but also the cambium. This is what allows the tree to grow in girth, uh, this meristematic tissue that allows trees to get bigger. The reason the EAB is so lethal is because it kills the cambium. So when your cambium and phloem are dead, uh, your tree is going to die. And the densities of these uh, beetle larvae underneath the bark of the tree can be amazing, uh, dozens to scores per square meter. Uh, hundreds or thousands per tree, depending on the size of the tree. So this can really, uh, this can really overtake an ash tree and bring it down very rapidly. Some of the symptoms to look for. I want to spend a minute on this. Some of these symptoms. Remember, symptoms are nonspecific. 
Uh, and I think part of the problem with diagnosing emerald ash borer is ash trees and landscapes often have uh, many of these symptoms that could be attributed to abiotic factors, soil conditions. They could be diseases. Um, they could be uh, a whole variety of factors that can cause this kind of um, dieback in the canopy that we see, uh, epicormic growth, thinning a canopy. And when we see this, I think we have a tendency historically not to look at this very carefully. But I think from here on out, when you see trees, ash trees in the landscapes with these types of symptoms, a little light bulb should kind of go on in your head. One of the big clues uh, that you have an emerald ash borer infestation or a borer infestation in general, of course, is the wood of work of woodpeckers. Remember, these guys have been after borers underneath the bark of trees for 20 million years. And they're very, very good at this. They're much better than you or I are at detecting these larvae under the bark of the tree. So surely when you see woodpeckers working ash trees, you know, a second light bulb should go on and uh, you want to go have a closer look. Vertical bark fissures. Uh, this is a very unusual symptom. I'm not sure about you, but uh, this is a symptom I don't typically see in trees is vertical bark splitting. Again, when the cambium dies underneath the bark of the tree, the tree can no longer grow in that area. So as the rest of the living cambium expands, it pulls apart the tree and you get vertical bark fissures. Pretty good clue that you've got dead cambium, perhaps emerald ash borers under the tree. Some of the signs now, we'll move over the things that are more diagnostic, it include things like the characteristic D-shaped exit hole. The other common borer that we have in our ash trees in here in Maryland are the clear wing borers, the banded ash clear wing, and the ash lilac borer. But when they emerge, they'll leave a round or an oval hole. This beetle, when it feeds, does not push the frass, the excrement, out of the hole. So if you don't see frass, that's a, uh, that's a bad thing. If you see frass either on the bark or under the tree, that's a good thing. Because the, um, this is an indication that you have one of the native borers uh, and uh, not the emerald ash borer. Uh, Bob, your question about will pyrethroids kill flying adults, you bet they will. Uh, pyrethroids permethrin will probably bring down F-14s if they fly through the clouds. So no question, they're going to bring down adults if you hit them. Another symptom you can look for, actually a sign here, is the pupil case. When your clear wing borers emerge, uh, they will leave behind the pupil case. In the case of ash lilac borer, uh, you'll see the pupil case in uh, springtime. This will be in April and May. In the case of the banded ash clear wing, that's a fall emerging critter. And you'll see that one probably in September. OK, again, the D-shaped exit hole, diagnostic. Uh, the beetle, even more diagnostic. Underneath the bark, S-shaped galleries, serpentine galleries, highly diagnostic. There are a couple other wood borers that get in there, um, wood boring beetles. But again, uh, this, is, this is highly characteristic. You're not going to see this kind of a problem with other insects. Whereas with your, um, your clear wing borers, rather than see S-shaped galleries, you're going to see linear galleries or patch type galleries. These are the galleries from the um, banded ash clear wing. And we do get some little scolited borers underneath the bark of the tree uh, engraver beetles that, uh, frankly, are, are usually not a problem. OK, so those are your diagnostic clues. The larvae are very easy to distinguish. Uh, on the emerald ash borer, the head is going to be indistinct. Whereas on your banded ash clear wing, it's going to have a clear, distinct head. On the thorax, there will be no legs. You will have no pro legs on the abdomen. Whereas on your clear wing borers, you're going to have both thoracic legs and pro legs with crotchets. On the rear end of this borer, you're going to find two appendages called the urogonfi. So pretty easy to tell the larvae apart. Now, Again, as Kim said, we're trying to approach this thing uh, using an IPM um, 
uh, philosophy or an IPM approach that's going to combine a whole bunch of different pest control tactics, biological control, regulatory control, quarantine eradications, chemical control. I want to go through some of these things just a little bit. Normally with our borers, one of the most important things we would like to do is to reduce plant stress because we know there's a clear link between plant stress and vulnerability to borers. Basically, the more you stress woody plants, the more susceptible they are to attack by borers. Unfortunately, with this particular beetle, it is so aggressive that um, the plant stress phenomenon probably contributes a little bit, but only a very minor amount. We just finished up a study on this. We found that really uh, stress does contribute somewhat, but it's not a major driver. These will attack what appear to be otherwise healthy trees. Resistant varieties is another way to go with this, and there is some encouraging news on this front. If we look at this, and again, we've got the case of an exotic pest, We've got native trees that are being attacked, and we could perhaps consider using exotic trees as replacements. I ask the question, who lives and who dies in this scenario? There's been a great study done by Eric Rebeck and uh, his colleagues Dan Herms, uh, Cliff Sadoff, and that group out in the Midwest. And what they did ex was expose our native ashes and then the exotic ash, the uh, Mansharika, uh, to uh, emerald ash borer, and uh, does anybody want to take a guess when you expose native ashes or exotic ashes, who lives and who dies? Who thinks that the native ashes live and the exotic ones die? Well, by the lack of answers here, I guess that you've all left or are sleeping. So I'll go ahead and give you the answer on this one. So what we can see then is because these exotic ashes, uh, the Manchuricas, uh, Manchurian ashes, have been duking it out with this particular pest for you know 30 or 40 million years over in Asia, they have very high levels of resistance, which is good. Whereas our native ash trees, which lack a coevolutionary history, simply are defenseless uh, against this particular new invader. And this is not unusual. You all remember the story, of course, about um, the American chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease. These are all cases where when we have this mismatch between, um, between a, a native uh, insect or a native plant and an exotic pathogen or pest, usually it gets clobbered. Um, diversity would be important, Dan, you're right, and we'll, get, we'll touch on that point very briefly, but unfortunately, uh, to date, we don't seem to have any North American ash trees that are resistant to this particular pest. I think we're concerned that all of these may be on their way out. <coughs> okay. Now, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, Kim is doing some very nice work. I just want to mention that this is a project, a joint project, uh, not only between uh, the uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture, but also USDA. My colleague, uh, Paula Shrewsbury, her postdoc um, over here at University of Maryland, a whole bunch of people are working on this particular team. And I think ultimately for places where we can't Places where we can't um, manage these things effectively, like our, our woodlots and our natural forests, I think uh, biological control is certainly going to be the best solution to this problem. It's probably going to be the only solution. <clears throat> now, what I'd suggest that if you, um, for my commercial arborists and landscape managers, this is definitely a website you need to bookmark. This is basically the Bible on um, chemical control, <clears throat> pardon me, chemical control for emerald ash borer at this point in time. And I just want to go through this pretty quickly. The active ingredients uh, which are going to be most readily available at this point in time are various products that contain the neonicotinoid imidacloprid. Those will be your Merit, your Zytec, your Imaget, and your Imicide. 
One of the newer materials is called triage emamectin benzoate. Uh, Bidrin is labeled. I don't think that's a material of first choice. Dinatefuran, Safari is in the mix. And the wet sprays over the top, of course, uh, include things as we would use for other borers, like permethrin and bifenthrin. <coughs> Pardon me. OK. <clears throat> Do these compounds work? Well, it looks pretty good. Um, this is some of Dave Schmidtley's work out in Michigan. Uh, these trees have been protected with imidacloprid. Uh, I think it's a pretty good indication that this is, can be highly efficacious. Um, I will come back to the question about how far will it fly in just a minute. We're going to touch on that. Um, the problem here, one of the things we need to be aware of is that in many cases, you will not begin to detect a problem with this borer until you're hitting about a 5 to 10 percent tree mortality. This often goes unseen. The problem with this is when you hit this, let's say, 10-ish tree mortality boundary, again, let's say here at 2001, you've only got about seven years before you go from 10% to 90% tree mortality. So what cities and municipalities have to do right now is to be proactive. If emerald ash borer is near, it is time to start the project now. All right, because once you see 10% of your trees missing in a city, you simply will not have enough time to intervene. And it's going to become very, very expensive. There are several cities in the Midwest that are essentially been bankrupt trying to manage this, pro this particular pest. In terms of efficacies, again, here are your untreated trees. Here are trees treated with the imidacloprid formulations in the fall. Notice that imidacloprid works much better with spring applications and doubling up uh, applications or double doses of applications are going to give you better results. But again, canopy decline can be confined with annual applications of imidacloprid, particularly applications done in spring. And these are uh, Dan Herms' slide. I want to talk about triage a little bit, the emamectin benzoate. All right, these materials, again, were applied back in 2006. Notice that on the control trees after two years, we're already up about 50% dieback. But with the emamectin benzoate, we're down here at about 10. So the emamectin benzoate is going to give you about two years of control. If you stop the treatments, then, the, of course, the uh, dieback is going to continue as the beetles continue to infest those trees. OK, again, just uh, a little bit more information on those trees treated in 2006. Good protection into 2008. It wasn't until 2009, into the third year, that we started to see uh, a loss of protection. So two to three years is a, is a high probability for the emamectin benzoate. Um, the important point I want to say with this slide is that, uh, if you, again, if you look at your emamectin benzoates, uh, your Imaget products, here are the different control levels. Again, the Imaget applied. Uh, the bottom line here is when your pest pressure is high, and what that means if you're in a very heavily infested area, so your trees are constantly under attack and under pressure from uh, emerald ash borer emerging from nearby trees, imidacloprid, your imidacloprid products are going to have to be applied every year to get you the uh, type of control that you would like to see. If you don't do that, the beetles will attack, whereas your emamectin benzoates are going to give you higher levels of control um, than you would get with your imidacloprid product, your Imaget product. 
Okay. The other uh, active material in the mix here is Dinotefuran Safari. And again, this is some of Dan Herms' information. Uh, percent canopy decline in untreated trees up here at about 80%. Uh, the trees were treated from 2008, 2012, evaluated in 2003, and with basal trunk sprays or soil injections of the Dinotefuran, the canopy uh, decline was held to somewhere less than about 20%. So you can get good control again with uh, annual treatments of Dinotefuran, um, but again, they are going to have to be annual. Some other considerations on the efficacies. Um, remember, with systemic compounds, you have to have an intact vascular system to transport these systemic materials to the canopy. If your canopy loss is already heavy, greater than 50%, uh, you're going to be able to move these materials much less efficiently from the soil or from the uh, trunk up to the tree. So the earlier you start your therapy, the better chance you will have a success. Again, as I've said, emamectin benzoate provides two years, we believe, imidacloprid and dinotefuran one. To move these compounds, again, you're going to have, uh, have to have active xylem transport. That means you're going to have to have moisture in your soil. That's usually not a problem here in Maryland in springtime. But if we were in a climate where we had dry springs, we probably would have to irrigate. Move back your mulch. Uh, mulch may be able to bind these neonicotinoids, so you want to remove your mulch. If you're using a soil probe, don't put it in too deep. Uh, if you go under 18 inches, all right, you're going to uh, simply be under your roots. You want to do a nice shallow injection if you're using a soil probe on this. Applications mid-April to mid-May, and you're going to allow four to six weeks for uptake of these materials. We're just starting to get better information now on what this means for big trees. Most of the data to date has come from little trees, but the, uh, the big tree studies are in the uh, field right now, so we should have a better feel for this uh, in a couple years, how this works on big trees. What's at stake? Okay, as I said, 16 species of native ash trees. Ash is a unique tree. It's in the olive family. There are about 8 billion ash trees uh, in um, the United States. 8 billion ash trees are at risk right now. Uh, the management costs are estimated to be somewhere between 20 and $60 billion for this particular pest. I wonder where that money's coming from. The other point I want to make here is that there are more than 20 other organisms associated with Fraxinus. That means if emerald ash borer takes these 16 ash species out, all these other species of organisms are simply going to go down the drain with them. So some people say, ah, it's just an ash tree. What are we going to lose? We're not going to lose just the ash trees. We're going to lose an entire community of organisms that are associated with ash. And to me, this is the real ecological impact, the ecological danger associated with emerald ash borer. OK. Um, I had a question about how far will it travel from M. Hollinger. Um, we're going to take, uh, take a look at this right now. Um, I just wrapped up a project a year or so ago, uh, again, with my postdocs, uh, my lab people, Dick Bean over at MDA, Alan Sawyer uh, from USDA APHIS, and this is some of the information we found. Basically using the uh, rate of spread, that uh, data that Kim showed you a little bit earlier, we were able to plot how rapidly emerald ash borer was spreading from the time it was first introduced. Uh, over the period of the eradication, uh, this is our simple linear model. And of course, the slope of this line is telling us the uh, rate of spread, right? Distance over time. Uh, 1.37 kilometers per year is something just a little bit less than about one mile per year. So under Normal conditions where there's not human transport, this model suggests that EAB is moving about a mile a year. More recently, 
we uh, added some additional data from a little bit later on, and unfortunately, we found this rate of spread is now accelerating. Uh, so this is not unusual when um, we have invasive species that they often start out slow, but they pick up speed, and we believe this is moving quicker now. Using this information, we were able to predict the time of arrival of emerald ash borer from various locations, Washington, D.C., Upper Marlboro, from the original introduction site in Brandywine. And we predicted that our, at our most aggressive model, the polynomial model, it should be in D.C. about 2013. And it was actually detected, I think, in 2012. So our model worked pretty good. The good news back in the day when we first developed these models several years ago was we thought Baltimore had a lot of time before it hit there. Um, we put it at 2022, even with our most aggressive rate of spread. But unfortunately, there was human transport to, ha to Howard and Anne Arundel County. So now it's just, uh, I guess, 14 or 16 miles away from Baltimore. And I expect it to be there much earlier than 2022. So that's what happens with human transport. We're simply going to accelerate these rates. How do you develop a management program then for EAB? Um, well, you have to, first of all, define your municipal tree population. And Kim talked about some of the nifty work that's been going on uh, in terms of inventories. Uh, we basically did these inventories six or seven years ago. So I'm going to walk through um, the process we used in helping communities uh, figure out their management strategy for emerald ash borer. OK, so the first thing to do is get your inventory. And uh, the technique we use to do this, or the tool we use this to do this, is, of course, the iTrees program. Um, you can use iTrees Streets. There's also an interesting, uh, very useful program called iTrees Eco that you can use. But this will allow you to generate the inventory for your municipality. Okay, so the first thing to do is to estimate your ash population size. And again, that's what we do. We, we generate random samples in different communities. Um, and we were able to uh, estimate the ash populations for Annapolis, Bowie, Upper Marlboro, I'm sorry, Greater Upper Marlboro, Marlboro and um, this is what the uh, results of those inventories were. And again, these are just street trees. This is not the entire urban tree population. But nonetheless, uh, we estimate that Annapolis had something in the order of 2,000 uh, street trees, Bowie about 129, Greater Upper Marlboro about 595. So <clears throat> this gave us our ash inventory. The next thing you want to do is you need to calculate the annual benefits of these ash trees. And fortunately, that's exactly what the iTree Streets program allows you to do. Now, all of this has been published. <clears throat> the literature citation is here at the bottom. We published this last year uh, in the Maryland Entomologist. But if we look now at the benefit of the ash population, we can see that um, for Annapolis, and let's just work with the case of Annapolis, due to energy, CO2 sequestration, air quality, stormwater remediation, and aesthetic value, the ash population in Annapolis constitutes a value of about $153,000 annually. And this is the important piece of the puzzle. This is the annual benefit. I think people forget that trees have value. I, one of the knee-jerk reactions is to simply go and cut down your trees. If you do this, this is the benefit you lose every year, every year. The other piece of software that's very important is the EAB cost calculator. Uh, this piece of software was developed by my graduate student, former graduate student, Cliff Sadoff, who is now at Purdue University. Again, it's free on the internet. Just go to this website uh, right here, and you can get the software. And when we run the numbers, the lower panel now, 
Under a management program where we remove all of the ash trees, it costs about $124,000 over a five-year time profile to replace all 600,000, to treat all 150 per year, I'm sorry, over a five-year time horizon. And the new model, the one I think that most people are favoring, is what they call urban slam, where you remove some of you, your smaller trees, you protect your larger, more valuable trees. In other words, you prioritize, and you do this sequentially over time. The important distinction I want you to see here is over five years under urban slam, you spend $54,000 to protect a resource that's giving you $152,000 annually. So if you run that out for six year, five years, you're up somewhere around $600,000 of benefit for $54,000 of cost. And I think this is the type of analysis that communities need to do uh, as they begin to plan for uh, emerald ash borer management. So this is the kind of analysis I think that could be useful. Okay, so that about covers it uh, from my point of view here. Um, again, thanks. I took a little longer, uh, Jonathan, than I'd hoped to, but uh, I hope that I've, I've given it a thorough coverage. Jonathan, I'm going to kick it back to you so um, you can take over. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mike. This is, this is quite informative. Um, I'm sure a lot of people get a lot out of that. Um, I'm going to, uh, I realize that um, we're probably not going to be done at one. Um, I've got about 15 minutes or so of presentation, so I'll ask you to bear with me, and um, we'll just uh, we'll finish this up. And I'm going to talk more about what the situation in existing woodlands. Um, uh, OK. And if you'll bear with me. for. Uh, somebody could just uh, at least uh, let me know that you can you can hear me. Okay, great. All right, that's great. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little about the woodland uh, side of this. Uh, let's do an extensive areas. And uh, uh, as Mike said, um, you know EAB is one of many forest sets that's come through, and it's pretty fairly extensive and different than some of the ones that we've experienced up till now, especially like things like gypsy moth, um, which has been a little bit more forgiving in some respects. Um, the real challenge I think that we have on our woodlands is that largely they're, we have very mature woodlands. Most of them are what we classify as solid timber of the Forest Service, which basically means they're greater than 12 inches in size. So there's a lot of ramifications for what happens when those trees uh, would die. As Mike said, it's not just about the individual tree, but all the other wildlife and organisms that rely upon them. So uh, that's something to consider. The question becomes then, you know, how much ash is there in the state of Maryland? Well, it's not specifically particularly uniform, but it's a much less than it is in uh, some other areas of, um, of uh, like Ohio and Michigan, which have had a lot of mortality. It's essentially about 4% on average, you know, about 81,000 acres if you want to look at it that way. But it represents a relatively small percentage of the uh, making up of the stocking of the stands. And you can see over here on this map the yellows are basically means less than two square feet of basal area. Um, and uh, you see maybe two to five percent. There's very few places where it makes up a substantial amount of the stocking of these stands. And just um, so you understand what that means, uh, oops, for one reason, some reason my slides it's, uh, not adapt here too well, but just to give you an idea of what basal area is, basal area is an indication of the cross-sectional area of the, actually of trees on an acre of ground. So if you were to cut all the trees off at four and a half feet off the ground and add up all that cross-sectional area that was actually in trees, in most stands you would want at least you know 90 to 100 square feet of basal area in many cases. And you can see at least on average maybe two to five percent of that makes up, uh, or less of that, makes up the average stand in the state of Maryland. But again, it's not uniform, so it varies you know, across areas where you would have a lot of ash in one area than another. Um, the real difference, I think, in the state of Maryland compared to some other states is that there's been a very aggressive um, tree planting program with hardwoods uh, across the state since the early 90s. 
Uh, and ash was a major species that was planted in these, uh, on, on these riparian forest buffers and other types of things. And a study done by the Maryland DNR in 2001, looking at the survival and success in those stands, found that in the western and central regions of the state, ash made up 21% in the western region of the stocking of those plantations and 14% in the central region. And that's a significant uh, amount of the stocking of trees that's in there. Um, so there's going to be a lot of um, uh, you know, ramifications if those trees die, which you know, many, looks like they probably will uh, in terms of what takes their place, may be desirable and may not be. So this is, that's a big issue. Um, in terms of EB, EB mortality, like just in the western Maryland area that I've heard of recently, there was a site in, um, in Clear Spring uh, where many trees in a uh, riparian buffer plant have been, have been killed and out in uh, far western Maryland uh, as well. Um, you can see out here there's the Maryland 4-H Center that's located out there and they've had EAB mortality. And actually it'd be very helpful if you know of any areas where there has been mortality in native woodlands now that we're talking about, uh, not in the cities and things like that. Uh, I would really appreciate if you would uh, let us know or let your, your, your uh, county forest or the Department of Natural Resources know as well. Because uh, as Mike said, you know, the, this is spreading around and it's there, but the level of mortality is a little unknown at this point and there is that kind of delay time between when it's present and when mortality actually starts to take place. And this is going to kind of give an indication of the, uh, of the amount of time that landowners have on their woodlands to actually make some decisions and I'm going to give you some strategies that will address that in just a, in just a few minutes. Uh, this is some close-up damage of uh, this site in, uh, in Clear Spring, and this is a, a buffer planting. Uh, these were young seedlings when they were planted, and you can see the, the dying back here. You can see the D-shaped hole. This is a, a mature woodland, and as Mike said, uh, these trees die out, and um, the woodpeckers start to get to them, and they start to, uh, they start to, to senesce and, 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 and fall apart. And I think that this is... Um, one area that's very different for, for a lot of folks here, many people have lived through gypsy moth where um, many trees actually managed to, even though they defoliated, managed to survive, many were, uh, did die, but the fact is that even those oak trees that were hit by gypsy moth, in many cases, uh, they, would, they would be there for a number of years and in fact, in terms of some type of a commercial harvest operation or salvage operation, you could go even there a couple years later and still uh, recover a lot of the value of that wood. Um, that's not what's been reported with ash at all from talking with foresters in Ohio and Michigan. Um, as soon as the trees basically die, they pretty much start to decompose and fall apart within a very short period of time. And in fact, ash uh, in Ohio, the, uh, the foresters there coined the term uh, ash, ash snap, which is basically what occurs typically within a year that these trees just kind of snap off, either from wind or something. They just, you know, they lose all their strength. And uh, that's, a, that's a big problem. It's very different than the gypsy moth that we've used to been dealing with. And again, let's say maybe one of the ideas here is that from a, uh, a, point of, a strategy point of view or a silvicultural point of view, and silviculture is the art and science of growing trees. So, you know, in other words, how can we treat the forest and have some desirable, some, know what the outcome is going to be in terms of what's going to be successful and what's not. In many cases with gypsy moth, one uh, strategy was before the trees died to actually harvest them and then the stumps would re-sprout. And those stump sprouts could then regrow because typically they weren't really hit that hard by gypsy moth. But uh, in fact, with the ash, uh, from the reports I've seen, stump sprouts are pretty much killed, uh, killed off immediately. So this is a very devastating uh, insect, there's no question about it. Very rapid decline after it's harvested or after, after it dies. And which makes the point that Mike said in terms of public safety and cities and other uh, areas with a lot of people, uh, it results in immediate action and a lot of cost because the trees just can't stay there for a long period of time. Well, some of the things I'm going to talk about here relate to what to do, uh, some strategies to deal with when ash is dominant in the canopy and when it's not. Um, and uh, if you look at a forest stand like this, you see you have dominant trees, which basically are those that have full sunlight. 
typically these trees are even aged. It's just that they're dominant because they've won out in the, in the striving for sunlight, and they've, they've overtopped the other trees. So you have co-dominant trees, which have less exposure to light. Intermediates, even more so, and suppressed trees, which are really have no direct sunlight. So uh, one of the designations we'll be saying is, are trees dominant in the canopy? And that means, do they make up the upper canopy of, of, of the forest there? They're your most uh, uh, successful trees in the stand. Um, Maryland really doesn't have a publication yet uh, on silvicultural strategies for woodland owners. In other words, specific recommendations. But other states do. Um, Ohio, uh, Michigan, and, uh, and Minnesota, uh, they've lived through this. And what I attempted to do in this presentation was kind of pull out some of the main points. I think this is something we need to put together real soon. Again, one advantage I think we have is that ash is not as large a component of most of the forest stands that we have. So uh, the impact is not going to be as great, but it will be locally so if you have a woodlot that has a lot of ash. And uh, these are just a few websites that are down here uh, where these publications can be found, emeraldashborer.info, and uh, most of them can be located from there. So I'm just pulling out some things. I don't, uh, I don't uh, say these were things that we put together, but I think we will put together something soon. So one of the, I guess, some of the key cons management concerns with loss of ash is that is the vulnerability of the stand, you know, in terms of exposure to ash. Uh, um, and I think what Mike said, in many cases, once it's there, it's unlike some other things that it's there, it's there, and the trees are there, they're probably going to die. But um, by removing the largest ash trees, I guess you can reduce some of the vulnerability because it's less of a foam source. But perhaps one of the biggest issues there is if there's a lot of value in those trees as well. And it makes sense for a landowner that uh, has some area of woodland and where commercial harvesting is an opportunity, they would certainly want to remove those largest, the largest ash trees, um, uh, those ones that are dominant and have high value. The other issue here is, at the same time, and many of these things you're trying to do together, is trying to keep that stand basal area at about 70, at least 70 square feet of basal area, which is kind of a lower level uh, for most forest stands where uh, you go start going below that, the trees are too widely spaced, and you're going to get more some more open grown characteristics, and it's not as desirable because you're not maintaining a, a, a canopy cover that can really sustain itself. Um, so uh, that being said, what you want to do is limit canopy gaps because we have the situation in Maryland, in many cases with invasive species, where if you do open gaps in the canopy, and if they are more extensive than could be filled in within a reasonable amount of time by the natural outgrowth of the species that are left, you're left with these big canopy gaps, and it allows your invasives to basically take hold. And that's just uh, not as desirable, um, something you want to avoid. Um, and, and I think while you'd like for landowners to have the option to kind of realize some of that value that may be there in terms of revenue before it's basically imminently going to be lost, we don't want to eliminate ash either. And uh, some of the numbers I saw mentioned was, you know, keeping 5 to 10 percent of the trees in ash for diversity point of view. Are they going to make it? Well, maybe likely not. But uh, and these are going to probably be trees in those lower classes of the, uh, of the canopy. Um, and that, that certainly makes sense to try and do that as well. So with that being said, uh, Ohio publication gives some, I guess, some general strategies on how to deal with this. And uh, it kind of separates into those ones where you have plantations and you have more, you know, larger forests. But, um, and this is just kind of pulled out of their publication. And where you have a majority of trees less than an inch and a half to two inches in diameter, there's really, uh, you know, not too much to be, that you can really do here. Those trees really have no value. There's probably other ones that are going to fill in. But where the trees are larger than that, um, then you want to start looking um, at, this, at this next strategy we have where, you have trees that are less than 12 inches diameter because what's happened at that point, the crowns have started to close and you have some options in management in terms of the, the things that you can do. So, you know, what are some of those strategies where you have stands where the dominant trees, in other words, are less than 12 inches diameter, 
at diameter breast height, and they, can, and you, they contain ash as a dominant part of the canopy um, right here. And DBH is a term, for those of you who don't know, in forestry, that's how we measure the diameter of trees, and that's diameter breast height, four and a half feet off the ground. So that's our common measure of diameter, not at the ground, but four and a half feet from the ground, and those are 12 inches. And these are trees that are largely not merchantable for the most, for the most part for any type of valuable forest products. And uh, if the stand contains adequate stocking of, of non-ash species, in other words, uh, if all those ashes are, ash are killed, in other words, you have heavy enough density or stocking of trees that even if those ash trees die, then really there's very little action uh, that's, that's needed. Okay? Uh, that's one option. But the other option as well is to go in there realizing that some of those trees are going to, those ash are going to die. That's going to open up other trees and allow them to grow. And you may or may not want those trees to, there. So you may want to do some type of a thinning uh, or a crop tree release, which means to go in there and basically pick the winners and the losers, acknowledging that those ash trees are kind of out of the picture and picking uh, those better trees from other species groups um, that, uh, that you would like to keep uh, you know, further on in the woodland for wildlife reasons um, or for whatever other objectives you might have. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing here is where we have trees less than 12 inches uh, and they can't ash, but they don't contain adequate numbers. And this is where it gets a little dicey. I mean, you don't have a lot of options in many cases. In other words, when those ash trees die, the stocking of that stand is going to be uh, at a very low level. Um, and the trees are going to be widely spaced. And again, the landowner always has the option for no, for no action. And there is always the option for some type of thinning a crop tree. But at some point, you know, um, this may be an option for the landowner that depending on, the, uh, on how low the stocking would be and how you know, few desirable trees there are in there, they may want to regenerate the plant, the stand, um, through some type of, you know, more of a clear cut or shelter wood harvest, or uh, actually go in there and plant seedlings. Uh, Underplanting of trees like you see here, in many cases is not largely overall successful in many cases, but it, it is a strategy that can be used if it's, if it's done appropriately. So this is the situation where I think some people may find themselves in where you don't have any great options and you really do need the input of a professional forester because these ideas of stocking and stuff and understanding what's desirable and what's not is something that you can get professional assistance on. Um, and thinning obviously is what you're, you're picking the winners and the losers and uh, you're allowing the space for certain trees to grow and if the ash are out of the picture, what are those trees that are going to take their place? This is where thinning allows you to make those choices. Uh, finally, is where you have trees where they're dominant, they're greater than 12 inches in diameter, and they do contain ash. Um, and these would be your more mature stands. Uh, uh, you know, these would be stands typically with high value. And these trees are pretty much going to be taken out uh, if you know that's going to happen. And it's likely that we're talking here in many parts of Maryland that from what Mike says and from what the indications are that within not too many years, uh, maybe sooner than later, because ash has maybe been in the area for, and it hasn't been, you see, yet you see low levels of mortality for a couple of years and then you get extensive mortality. The option is always to take no action. Uh, that's certainly something that can be done. Uh, but this is where a commercial harvest would certainly make sense to eliminate those ash uh, and, and remove them, especially those that have value. And it allows you at the same time to, depending on the stocking of the forest there, the level of the stand, to remove other species as well. So, um, and again, this should be something uh, you should have a, a, a forester, either a state service forester can give, develop management plan or private consultant or industrial foresters can help you with these decisions. And, uh, and you could have basically no commercial harvest and you could just cut or dead ash in the stand. That's, a, that's another option uh, rather than waiting for it to happen on its own. So, Commercial harvesting, uh, and this is actually, uh, I own property in West Virginia. This was uh, done last fall, uh, last summer actually. And um, this was because ash had basically uh, was in the, the, the forest that we had in Calhoun County. And these, these trees were just riddled with borers. Um, if they hadn't been gotten last year, they probably would have been, had no value. And these are just from what you can see, all the, uh, all the borers and the tunnels that, that is uh, endemic. So 
one of the real challenges I think for a lot of the woodland owners is that a lot of the forest stands now are much smaller in size. In many cases, forest harvesting on a commercial basis is an absolute real challenge. And I think that one thing you want to avoid is panicking. And uh, you know, people knocking at your door just wanting to cut your ash trees. You don't want to make those quick decisions. You want to really get advice from a professional forester before you make these harvest decisions. You do have time to do that. And uh, I wouldn't re react by saying, oh, well, they're going to be gone. And you know, some people may want to take advantage of that situation. So get professional assistance before you make any type of a harvest decision. Um, and who owns these woodlands? Um, many people think the government owns woodlands. But in fact, 42% of Maryland is wooded. And 76% is owned by private family forest owners. And um, so the future of, of ash, in many cases, <laughs> Uh, or any management decisions that are made uh, relies on over 155,000 owners that own those properties and getting some uh, getting some good assistance. And in many cases, some of these properties, many of these properties are very small in size, but if there is value there, in many cases, commercial harvests are available um, on on small properties. And in fact, I would say that uh, this whole idea of woodland storage is important, knowing the responsibility, having a sense of responsibility knowing the opportunities and aware of the consequences. And uh, one thing, uh, by getting assistance from a professional forester, you'll get an idea of the situation you're in. There's service foresters with DNR, consulting foresters, industrial foresters. And I would say also on our website uh, down below here, uh, we also have a directory of foresters who have indicated they are willing to work with landowners on woodland properties that are under 10 acres in size specifically. That's a real challenge for many uh, landowners having small properties. But if you go to our website, you'll see a small acreage of forest directory. And these are registered professional foresters willing to work on these smaller properties. So with that said, um, I would just, um, um, just wrap it up. I realized that we're running late. And uh, before everybody you know, kind of gets out here, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. And we can people want to stay around can ask a few questions. but uh, um, I would just like to ask you here, you would just answer this. What do I plan to do uh, within the next year as a result of seeing of, 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 of this webinar? And, um, and also I want to ask you, for those of you that um, have property, uh, do you plan to implement some of what you've learned on the property you own or lease? And also we always ask you this question, <laughs> typically, if um, in terms of dollar value, do you think this, this information has value? And if you were to assign a value to it, what do you think it might be based on, inf you know? And uh, with that being said, um, we have our three speakers, I believe, are still on the line. And um, I will just wait just a minute here to close out these, these polls to see as, if everybody has responded. And, um, if you have a question, uh, I guess I would ask you please to you know, put it in the chat box right now. And um, also, for those of you that pesticide credits and SAF, I realize I forgot to give you the secret word for Mike Raup's presentation. And that word is IPM. And for my presentation, uh, that would be woodland. So just to. I'll just give you all right here, but there's three words you need on your certificates. Uh, for, for Kim, it was TRAPS, T-R-A-P-S. For Mike, it was IPM. For myself, Woodland. And you'll just put those on the back of your, your forms when you return them uh, to Pam Thomas. So um, with that, uh, we'll see if there's any questions here. And I'm kind of looking. It looks like Jim Cook is asking, are there any resistance breeding programs? And uh, those folks, uh, Mike and Kim, can uh, turn their microphones on. They can respond um, uh, in voice. And that, that'll work. Um, Jim, yeah, yeah the, uh, it, they are working on this. They've tried at least one cross already of the Manchurian with, uh, with one of the green ash species, I think. And unfortunately, uh, the North American genes won out, 
and uh, it turned out to be as susceptible as the parental stock. But it's a great question, and they are looking at that right now. And I think one thing we really have to consider here, I mentioned those other 40 species that are, are maybe going to go down the drain with the ash trees. Uh, I don't think it's beyond the realm that we, we might consider um, we might consider some of these Chinese ashes. These are very good species. Uh, they are not invasive species, and they may be able to serve as kind of an arc or a, a zoo or a reservoir for some of these other insects and associated arthropods that may go extinct if our North American ash uh, do go extinct. So I think it's, it's an interesting challenge, but there are breeding programs underway uh, to try to look at that. Okay, we have any other questions? And I apologize for the kind of the ramshackled way I'm doing the pesticide credits. It's the first time we've done this. So for those of you who need a meeting number for the Maryland pesticide credits, uh, that would be, um, that'd be meeting number one. I guess that's it. This uh, webinar will be posted. Uh, we have one, somebody else typing. So I'll make sure we got all the questions. Okay. Well, Mike and Kim, thank you very much. I think this is a good webinar. And what I've found with webinars, in many cases, we had about 38 people. In many cases, there's a lot more people that will view it later. And uh, thanks a lot for everything. And uh, um, have a great day.